that is no doubt a fascinating passage. Let me see if I have this on the right way. How are we going there with sound? Can you hear me? Yep. Speakers on? Good. Quite a fascinating passage that we uh, need to wrap our heads around. Uh, I will ahead of time apologize if I'm coughing. I have my throat spray. In fact, I should go like that. I've got lozenges. I have water. So may God uh, give endurance to the throat and to us. And uh, before I pray, I've got a special announcement too. Uh, in two days, we will have an octogenarian in our midst. And Max Eggins' 80th birthday is on Tuesday. So uh, make sure you wish him a happy one afterwards. And uh, we've organized a little cake just uh, as a praise to the Lord for uh, blessings to a man who loves his church and prays for everyone and encourages you. And so I hope you'll be encouraged, Max, afterwards and with a little cake, because it's a little cake. Parents, let's leave it to adults only so the locust plague doesn't come and just poof, it's gone. Okay? <clears throat> but why don't, why, don't we, uh, why don't we pray? Lord in heaven, we, uh, we thank you for all that you are and the life you give and uh, we praise you for the life of Max and decades of faithful service, both as a pastor in his younger days, but still as a faithful churchman who walks with you and encourages the body. May, may you bless him and give him many more years of, uh, of pew ministry, as Brett just spoke about. Lord, thank you for words of life, and we pray in this tricky passage, you will give us insights into your character and nature and how then we should live, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, for lessons about the spiritual life, Jesus often pointed his disciples to plants, uh, Consider the mustard seed and its growth potential, that fig tree with no fruit, uh, the lilies of the field in their splendor. So I'd like to ask you to consider a plant, the breathtaking sunflower. But my question is, why do all sunflowers face the same direction? Well, here's a 10-second video clip from a university that's going to answer that with a very American accent. Why do sunflowers follow the sun? More sunlight equals better growth, and the plants know it. New research shows this sun tracking is a circadian rhythm. The plants turn overnight to face east because their internal clocks anticipate sunrise. See, so sunflowers face the sun to grow and mature, daily turning to the sun's light and fullness. Christians face the sun, S-O-N, to grow and mature, to deeply know Jesus. In the knowledge of God's Son, grow into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Keep your eyes on Jesus. But instead of maturing in Christ-likeness, some stagnate by remaining largely ignorant about the depths of the riches of Christ. Now, now, usually this is due to laziness and sin, uh, but sometimes it's due to circumstances that eclipse or obstruct one's view of the sun, limiting the knowledge of the fullness of Christ and his kingdom, or, and limiting our understanding of the unity and the gifting of his spirit and dwelling, his people. And in our passage today, we meet people who have an eclipse or obstructed view of Jesus. Some are fully ignorant of him, and others are ill-informed about certain things, incomplete. So we might, in summary, call them deficient dudes. And since there will be 12 in chapter 19, we'll call them the dozen deficient dudes. <clears throat> Now, in those situations, sunflowers need repotting, right? So they have direct access to sunlight. And for Christians, then, believers who seem root-bound uh, in their ill-informed, restrictive planter pots, well, they need 
brothers and sisters like you to shine the light of Christ into their lives, to shatter those restrictive planter pots. And so they spread their roots in the soil of the new covenant to thrive and grow and bear fruit. So so the main idea of this challenging passage today in the book of Acts is this. Discipleship is helping others, sorry, discipleship is helping others uh, see Jesus more clearly and grow to know him more deeply, okay? So that's the, the main idea. It's, it's a very bitsy passage with a lot of transition with what's going on. Uh, basically, Paul's ending his second missionary journey, and before you blink your eyes, he's started his his third one, there's a haircut thrown in there and a vow, and um, it's really interesting, chapter 19. But despite all that murkiness and bitsiness, there's actually the scope of application is quite simple for us that we'll get to. And uh, what, what's, what we see is what's rare in the book of Acts is that crucial ministry is happening that is non-preaching ministry from a non-apostle. An everyday John and Jane Christian, a couple named Aquila and Priscilla, who disciple Apollos and bless the church at large with their time, talents, and treasures. So, so there's a lot to take away. And uh, the outline is making Jesus clear and then we all can help make Jesus clear. So that's how we're going to pursue this, this bitsy passage. And how I'd like to approach it is quickly run through the guts of it and then come back to address these two main sections, but in reverse order. So making Jesus clear, the details of that are more in chapter 19, verses 1 to 7. And then how we all can do that, we see in chapter 18 with Aquila and Priscilla. That's where the guts of the application is. So that's what I want to end with, not with this rather obscure thing happening in Acts 19. So, first a quick run through, handling the transitional bits. Look at your Bible in verse 18. Paul said, farewell to the brothers and sisters, that's in Corinth, and sailed away to Syria. Now, if you haven't been with us, Paul's wrapping up his second missionary journey, heading back from the city of Corinth, where he just had 18 months of refreshing, persecution-free ministry, and he's sailing to Antioch in Syria. Now, remember, this is his sending church from Antioch, so he wants to report back to them about the amazing things that God has been doing in expanding the kingdom of Christ. And verse 18 then adds, he was accompanied by Aquila and Priscilla. They're the tent makers we saw last time at the start of the chapter who worked alongside Paul, not just making tents, but making disciples. We'll return to their story towards the end. Verse 18 continues, because of a vow Paul had taken, he shaved his head at Sencrea. Now, that's the east port of the city of Corinth. So, just to, uh, so he's heading off after his 18 months in Corinth. And a few things are worth noting here that he, he because of a vow, he, he shaved his head. First, this is most likely a Nazarite vow described in the Old Testament in Numbers chapter 6. That's the vow Samson made you don't cut your hair. In fact, there's three things. If you want an easy way to remember the three things of the Nazarite vow, it's pretty simple. No swigs, no stiffs, no scissors, okay? No alcohol, no touching dead bodies because they're unclean, and no haircuts. That's a Nazarite vow. Now, at the end of the Nazarite vow, you would take the hair that you've cut off and you actually offered it up to the Lord in an offering. Now, if you're a man like me, um, every morning you look down in the shower and say, Lord, my offering to you today, right? But that's what was done as this 
this, this vow you would take, and the only place you could offer up anything was in the temple in Jerusalem. And this is probably why Paul goes out of his way to Antioch via Jerusalem to offer up his hair to the Lord from this vow. And the final thing we want to note about this vow is it's voluntary. It's an act of dedication to the Lord. Uh, Jesus is the Lamb of God who died for the sins of the world. Paul would not, now that Christ has died, Paul would not bring an animal for a sin sacrifice because Jesus has paid it all. But this is a voluntary offering of, of thanksgiving and of dedication. So, it it's like in Romans 14 where Paul talks about those, those matters of conscience that each person is free. As long as something doesn't contradict the gospel and affect fellowship, we're free to sort of follow customs. And with Paul being a Jew, that was a custom he was used to. And he had liberty to continue to do that, at least while the temple was still standing in Jerusalem. Now, Luke doesn't tell us what Paul vowed, but being fulfilled at Sancria right after Corinth, uh, and a good educated guess would be that after four cities of being pummeled and persecuted, like we saw last time, Paul made a vow of dedication to God that went something like, Lord, if you give me respite in the city of Corinth, I will remain here as long as you want. Eighteen months, Paul's there. Could have included an element of thanksgiving. Lord, thank you for 18 months of persecution-free ministry. If you want me to do a third missionary journey, I will do that to you, Lord. So, with practices like fasting or vowing, we, they can still be part of the Christian life. Uh, Jesus' instruction, though, as a caution, is let your yes be yes and your no be be no, right? Stick to your word. Don't play games like those, those fingers-crossed Pharisees, right, with their excuses. Well, you know, I'd love to fulfill my vow, but I swore an oath to Jerusalem, not, not to the name of the Lord, so <laughs> I'm off the hook. No. Paul kept his vow. So should we. Everything from little daily promises to marriage vows from doing the chores you said you do to serving Jesus like you promised to. Well, pressing on. Look back in your Bibles at verses 19 to 21. When they reached Ephesus, Paul left them, Priscilla and Aquila, there. But he went into the synagogue, he debated the Jews, and they asked him to stay for longer, but he declined. And he said, farewell, I'll come back again if God, if God wills. And he left Ephesus. Fascinating, because in, in chapter 16, he tried to go to Ephesus, but was prevented to do so, and went to Europe. And now they're saying, stay, and he says, no, I've got to move on. Uh, he's, he's keen to fulfill his vow to the Lord. And uh, he leaves Aquila and Priscilla behind in Ephesus, and he heads home. Verse 22, on landing at Caesarea, the port city, he went up to Jerusalem, greeted the church, then went to Antioch. He's on furlough. That's how we'd say it today. A missionary comes home, gives reports, and encourages the church. And so ends Paul's second missionary journey. Blink your eyes. Paul's on his third missionary journey. Look at verse 23. After spending some time there, he set out to travel through one place after another in the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So this is modern-day Turkey, and Paul is retracing his steps from his first mission trip, <coughs> building up these young churches as uh, most were being persecuted and needed encouragement and answers to new theological questions that came their way. We're going to return to verses 24 to 28 and the ministry of Aquila, Priscilla, and Apollos. So now we jump ahead to that section in 19 verse 1 where it says, while Apollos was in Corinth, 
Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He remembered how keen they were to hear more, so he goes back to the greatest city in Asia Minor with the great temple of Artemis, a quarter of a million people. And uh, the gospel confrontation he has with the idol makers of Artemis, it's phenomenal. That's later in the chapter. We'll come back to that next time. This morning we only look at verses 1 to 7 now. <laughs> Put on your thinking caps, because this is not easy, okay? I'm not going to, but at least Jesus is easy to understand. And it's here that Paul makes Jesus clear to these guys. So, verses uh, 1 to 7, he found some disciples. The text doesn't say disciples of whom yet. Uh, Verse 7 says there are about 12 of them, so again, there are a dozen deficient dudes. Paul sensed something was off with these guys. So he asked them a really interesting question that you just don't have elsewhere in the book of Acts. Look at verses 2 and 3 in your Bibles. He found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Well, into what were you then baptized? Into John's baptism, they said. Now, there's a lot strange about the details here. For starters, if they were baptized by John, this is John the baptizer, how could they not have heard of the Holy Spirit? Because it was John who said, I baptize you with water, but the one who comes after me is greater than me. I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So it's mystifying how these guys could be John's disciples and and not heard of the Holy Spirit. Any disciple from an Old Testament background would hear about the Holy Spirit repeatedly in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was hovering over the earth at creation, empowering prophets and judges, anointing kings and high priests. So this ignorance has actually led a lot of commentators to suggest these guys were nominal disciples. That means in name only. They didn't have a a devotional or true faith and practice. In other words, they were not genuine believers never pursuing the truth that John himself taught. You see, John pointed to Jesus. John said, he must, he must increase, I must decrease. And John identified Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's interesting, Clement, a second century church father, spoke that there were still a few disciples of John left in his day in the second century. So one option is that these deficient, deficient dozen dudes are part of a cult who followed John as the Messiah, even though John clearly said, I am not him, you must follow Jesus. If this is the case, then these disciples are not born again. They're not believers in any sense of the word. So here Paul brings the good news, and they actually believe and trust in Christ. They're born again, become Christians, and receive the Spirit. The other option is that these guys, like like other genuinely saved Old Testament disciples, who trusted in the provision of God's forgiveness and look forward to the promised Messiah to be the one to pay it all, well, they knew John's specific promise was that Messiah would come in his lifetime, but then the twelve, after being baptized by John, actually left Israel before John publicly identified Jesus. Behold the Lamb, there he is. Acts 19, verses 4 and 5, give the impression they'd never heard of Jesus by name. They're important, so I'll put them up to see. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, 
telling the people they should believe in the one who had come after him. Get over John. The one after him is Jesus. So when they heard this, they were baptized into the name of Jesus. How could they have never heard the name of Jesus? Well, let's start by remembering you know, look, what, what time are we? There's no Google, there's no internet, there's no printing press, there's no airplanes, there's no telephones. Like, word travels much slower back then. But, but beyond that, maybe they heard, if they heard something, that John got his head cut off and served on a platter to Herod. And his disciples of John, oh, we're not going back to Israel because we want to keep our heads on our shoulders. Thank you very much. Or, or maybe given the common but misguided view of Messiah, that he would be a military leader, these 12 might have assumed, hey, you know, when Messiah comes, we'll know because Rome will be overthrown and Rome is still growing, so he hasn't come yet. Or it just could be like this is a real-life scenario from the, the mid-1700s when pioneers from the British colonies on the east coast of this place called the Americas went west to find and settle new territory. And uh, when they got to the west with broken down wagons, the death of horses and fear of Native American Indians, well, the settlers stayed up in the Catskill Mountains for 20 years. These pioneer settlers, they saw no other Europeans until eventually a new group of settlers came through. And remember, this is the mid now to late 1700s. And the mountaineers then asked these new settlers, what's going on back in the colonies? And these new pioneers said, colonies? That's a bit of weird language. So they asked back, what do you think of the new American Republic? And did you vote for George Washington? Vote? president, uh, these guys are subjects of the British King George in their mind, and um, they hadn't even heard of George Washington or the American Revolution. <laughs> That's a real story in the 1700s, and it was about 20 years since Jesus began his public ministry that Paul met these guys in Ephesus, and whatever the reason, we don't know, these dozen Ephesians had not heard about Jesus or the Holy Spirit. John is the last prophet of the Old Testament. Jesus made this clear. Um, the law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom has been proclaimed and everyone is urged to enter. Messiah is here. So Paul had to make Jesus clear to these Messiah-expecting Jews in Ephesus. See, Messiah first is not a soldier delivering from Rome. He's a Savior delivering from sin, our sin. And uh, he is the substance that fulfills all of those old covenant shadows fulfilling the promised new covenant. And, and unlike the old covenant, where it was judges and kings and priests and prophets upon whom the Holy Spirit came for ministry and gifting, well, a key promise of the new covenant is every believer, who, that is, everyone who repents and trusts in Jesus, is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, united to his body, the church, and gifted by the Spirit to serve one another. See, God's Spirit no longer dwells in a building in Jerusalem, but in every Christian and collectively in the living temple, the church. So 1 Corinthians is really clear that every Christian is baptized in the Holy Spirit. We were all baptized in one spirit, into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. The deficiency of John's baptism is that it was a water-only baptism, 
devoid of the Spirit indwelling and empowering all believers of the new covenant and uniting us into one body, the, the body of Christ. And this is why what the norm, again, the norm is what we see in Romans chapter 8. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So what exactly is going on here in Acts 19? This, this is peculiar, especially verse 6, which says, Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in other tongues and, and prophesy. If Christians have the Spirit, well, that, that's the norm. Let's think through the larger context of the book of Acts so far. Three times the Holy Spirit has come upon people. Can you remember to whom and where that occurred? I'll help you out in case you're shy to answer. Uh, to Jews at Pentecost in chapter 2 in Jerusalem, to Samaritans who are half-Jews in Samaria in chapter 8, and then to Gentiles, non-Jews in chapter 10. So, what's fascinating here is that this should ring a bell with the, the table of contents verse in the book of Acts. Do you remember the table of contents verse back at the introduction of the book? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So the Holy Spirit is given as the good news of Jesus spreads to three people groups that cover all people groups, Jews, half-Jews, and non-Jews. And so these attesting signs and wonders were proof that half-Jews and non-Jews were also part of the people of God, Jesus' kingdom. And remember, the Spirit comes to people groups. No example of the Spirit coming upon just an individual occurs in the book of Acts, whether the Ethiopian eunuch, Simon Magi. Uh, so two things seem to be happening here, and then we'll get practical in the in, uh, Aquila and Priscilla section. First, this seems to be the only possible leftover people group, the last outpost of any people group, and that is people baptized by John that Messiah is coming in this generation but didn't know that Jesus had come. And this, this is not repeatable. Uh, the generation of John is gone, and this transitional people group is, is past, but this was proof that they too could be the people of God. The second thing that's really important in the book of Acts is this is actually to prove that Paul is a full apostle, which was questioned by some of the churches because remember, you had to, you had to be an eyewitness to Jesus' resurrection to be an apostle. That was a criteria. Paul calls himself one untimely born because the resurrected Christ appeared to him after right after the resurrection and ascension on the road to Damascus. And so to prove apostles, uh, Paul's apostleship, in the other three cases when the Holy Spirit came on Jews, half-Jews, and non-Jews, apostles were there, usually Peter and John. A and sometimes with the laying on of hands. When the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, those no good half-breeds, well, they sent Peter and John to them. They needed to see it for themselves. And oh, it was true. So Peter and John laid their hands on these half-breeds, and they received the Holy Spirit. This is personal confirmation by an apostle that even these Samaritans were the people of God. And Gentiles, too, when it happened again, fully accepted Christians, an international people of God. And now Paul is confirmed as one of the apostles. Well, that's what's partly going on. And um, as far as application, there isn't a ton to apply from this except this. We're done with the heavy theology. Whew. Um, if these dozen disciples, 
were unsaved, on the cult fringe of the church. They'd be more like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses today because we don't have a lot of Jews on the, on the fringe of the church. This passage teaches us that if they are to be saved, they must embrace the clear biblical Jesus, not some counterfeit. No, the sinless Son of God, fully man, fully divine. There's no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. And Paul proclaimed the name of Christ. They repented, believed, and were baptized in the name of Jesus. That would include, too, remember the Father sent His Son, and then the Son sent His Spirit on the church. And so, This would mean accepting the biblical doctrine of the Trinity, one God and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, baptized in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I guess to get practical for us here, most of of us probably know this, but this salvation should be evidenced in our lives by putting the gifts of the Spirit to use in our lives to build up His church, and evidenced by the fruit of the Spirit in your lives, living in the holiness of the Holy Spirit. See, look at this verse from Romans chapter 8. If by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, and this is talking about eternal life in context, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God, destined for resurrection and eternal life. Now, led there is not led in guidance. It's led to put to death sin in our lives. So the questions we should be asking ourselves from a passage like Acts 19 is, amidst the ups and downs, am I nonetheless growing in holiness in my life? Am I, by the Spirit, putting to death sin in my life? Do I have some clear victory markers that God is at work in me? And we should also be asking ourselves in a passage like this, well, if I have the Holy Spirit, how am I using the gifts that He's given to serve and advance the kingdom of Christ? Am I using the gifts that he's given to serve his body. See, the Spirit has come not just to comfort, but to empower us, to witness as his ambassadors, to make the body of Christ beautiful and a glory to the world. So I hope Christ is clear to you, and I hope evidence of his Spirit in you is plentiful, in you and amongst us. Okay, now for the more simpler practical part. We all can help make Jesus clear. Look in your Bibles at verses 24 and 25. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native Alexandrian, an eloquent man who was competent in the use of the Scriptures, arrived in Ephesus. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. He was speaking and teaching accurately about Jesus although he only knew John's baptism. So you can see the link between these two passages is John's baptism. That's where the similarities end. See, Apollos at least had learned about Jesus, right? It says that he was speaking and teaching accurately about Jesus. This guy was a powerful speaker, trained in rhetoric. He grabbed your attention. This is the guy you want to hear at the Brisbane Convention Center, right? Hey, did you hear Apollos is coming to town? Man, can we get him preaching in our church, right? Yet accuracy about Jesus was incomplete. Verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. After Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God more accurately. That's why the title of our passage is A More Accurate Way. What was inaccurate isn't clearly stated, but it was significant enough to actually pull him aside 
and pour into him because he was getting stuff not quite right. It's clear he was familiar with the life and ministry of Jesus. Likely the death and resurrection of Jesus. But since he knew only John's baptism, he was unaware of the glories that followed. See, the, the ascension of Jesus, and, and what that really signifies, that Jesus identified with the Son of Man in, in Daniel 7. He is the exalted King of heaven, crowned in, and ruling on high, seated at the right hand of the Father. The, the very verse that Jesus quoted when he was on trial, and the high priest responded, he is blasphemed. Do we need any more witnesses? Put him to death. So the prophet Isaiah wrote that Messiah, of, of Messiah, the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. And therefore, the victorious Messiah, who not only died but is risen and ascended and crowned, well, he can then send his Spirit at Pentecost to empower the church and embolden us to witness as his ambassadors. This and much more, Apollos was taught about Jesus, the Messiah. So when he heads to Corinth, he's not just bold now. He's actually more on target, verse 28. He vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating through the Scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. See, now he's got Jesus really right. He wasn't just a guy John pointed to who did a lot of cool miracles and awesome teaching and parables. He died, rose, ascended. He's the king, and he sends his spirit. So he's been equipped in the clarity of Christ to marvel at Messiah. And he also builds up the church in Corinth. Look now at verse 27. He was a great help to those who by grace had believed. See, this is why Paul wrote to the Corinthians, I planted, but Apollos watered. Right? Here in verse 27, Apollos is watering the soil of believers in the glories of Christ. But Apollos could only water others effectively because he was poured into by one couple who repotted Apollos so he could have direct sunlight, the Son of God, and see Jesus more accurately and be rooted and strengthened and bear more fruit in new covenant glories. There's a lot to apply from these verses, but, but Apollos went on to do a lot of stuff. A lot of people think he wrote the book of Hebrews, the unnamed author of Hebrews. But he did what he did because he was poured into by the ministry of the pew. So let's think about what we can apply. Aquila and Priscilla, they're mentioned six times in the Bible, and every single time they're mentioned together. It's almost like the biblical authors couldn't think of one without the other. The two have become one flesh, not, not just in words and in theory, but in practice and in ministry. And, and they were a dynamic duo. They had an effective ministry together. Okay? That's the first thing we see about them. The three times in Acts 18, they're mentioned together serving the Lord when they work alongside Paul, travel with Paul, and disciple Apollos. They're serving the Lord in Rome together. As Paul writes, Give my greetings to Prissa, short version, and Aquila, my co-workers in Jesus Christ. They're back home in Rome now because the edict of Claudius is over. They're back home, and they're there laboring in the gospel together. They're serving the Lord in Ephesus together. They were mobile for the gospel. The churches in Asia, Paul's, Paul's writing, the churches of Asia from Ephesus send you their greetings. Aquila and Priscilla send you warm greetings in the Lord along with the church that meets in their home. Now, I often say these words in a marriage ceremony. The bride and groom believe that together, as husband and wife, they can better serve their Savior 
all of their days. I often say that in a marriage ceremony, but it doesn't always work out that way. See, marriage is a primary arena of spiritual battle where two sinners are intimately united, vulnerable. Sometimes things get worse for the gospel when people don't follow Christ well. A godly marriage requires effort, a kingdom focus, taking up the cross, dying to self, and fixing our eyes on Christ. And that is what we see in Aquila and Priscilla. They put that effort in. Don't think a a godly marriage comes easy. Fight for it. If you're married, in what ways are you clearly dying to self? In what ways are you serving the Lord together? Now, even if gifting is a bit different, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't serve together. Some, some of you here are exemplary and inspirational, honestly, in this regard, from welcoming ministry to children's ministry together, from kitchen ministry to grace group hosting to counseling ministry together. Our church is deeply indebted and grateful for your together ministry of the pew that complements the ministry of the pulpit. May your tribe increase. And singles, don't settle for anyone who is interested and available. Wait patiently both to find the one and to become the other one who strive for Christ's glory in a complementary fashion. So you can truly say on your wedding day, we believe that together as husband and wife, we can better serve our Savior. Amen? And speaking of serving in a complementary manner, at some stage we'll do an entire sermon devoted to the topic of complementary versus egalitarian views of roles of women. Uh, Right now, we're just going to focus on a few things. By the way, egalitarian means that any ministry that a man can do in the church, uh, a woman can do with full approval from God, senior pastor, elder, whatever. Where complementary means many ministries can be done together, but in God's design, there, there are a few roles and ministries distinct to gender, and therefore those genders complement rather than mirror in that role. A, a fuller expression of that topical sermon will come, but for now, um, it, like a sign that says, don't look inside this hole, right? Uh, many respond, no way, ma'am. If you restrict me, I'm doing it. Some people want to push back at any restriction uh, as negative or oppressive. Trust me, when in the Garden of Eden, God said, eat from any tree except this one, it wasn't oppressive. It was for our good. And, and so it is in a a church. We're a complementarian church. But I think a problem in a complementarian church is people can tend to focus on the very few things that women don't do. And uh, I want us to focus on what Aquila and Priscilla can do and do. So look at this. Together they pour into Apollos theologically. That's why we want women to be equipped in theology. There are women in the Grace Bible Church Network, and including here at Logan, who are in Bible college to grow in their theology. Hallelujah. We want women to teach the Bible clearly, powerfully, to women and children. But their ministry to Apollos is discreet. It's not recklessly undermining God's order. See, Verse 26 says, Apollos began to speak boldly in the synagogue after they took Apollos aside. The NIV says they they took him home because that's where a lot of aside ministry happened and explained the way of God to him more accurately. See, whether or not it was in the home, 
they didn't stand up in the synagogue and correct Apollos and, and shame him. They didn't disrupt the worship service or humiliate him. See, Priscilla wasn't in a position of authority in the church in this circumstance. She's just a sister, along with a brother, Aquila, pouring into Apollos, filling gaps in his theology, in his Christology, the doctrine of Christ, in a role of informal discipleship. Like grace groups, our small groups where we gather and mix gender and everybody can contribute and participate because wisdom about walking with Christ is shared. And uh, we want to hear from men and women. What's interesting is the six times that Aquila and Priscilla are mentioned in the book of Acts, four times it's Priscilla and Aquila. And her name comes first. In the USA those historically rebellious colonialists and anti-monarchists, uh, it's much more common to say Meghan and Harry rather than Harry and Meghan. Not just because Meghan Markle is an American, but she's famous. She's a pop star. She's influential. As my mom says, Meghan Markle is called Meghan Sparkle by Americans, right? Likewise, Priscilla seems to be very influential, very gifted, and she used her, her gifts. She also seems to be a woman of means. Uh, they had a house in Rome and a house in Ephesus, as we saw in previous verses. We shouldn't deduce that Aquila's ministry was insignificant and that Priscilla was domineering, but her inclusion is another example of godly women being used in the church to advance the name of Christ, and beautifully so. In the final way that we see they serve together, we've already hinted at it, but hospitality. Whenever they're mentioned in Scripture, they're opening up their home. They open their home for Paul in Corinth, for Apollos in Ephesus. When they lived in Ephesus and lived in Rome, they opened their house to the church that met there. Wow. They used their means, their resources to bless. This can also be true of single people, by the way. You don't have to be married. And single women, too. In Philippi, remember Acts 16, uh, the businesswoman Lydia no husband is mentioned, but she has quite an estate or a household. And back then, even if you were an heir, you, she was probably widowed. But now, she's probably single. And regardless, she opens up her home for gospel hospitality, first to Paul and Silas. But then at the end of the chapter, this new church plant in Philippi is meeting in her home. Lynn Freudeman hosts a grace group. Imelda, the, her grace group, rotates through her house. And then with Michelle Hunwick, who's now with us uh, from Holland Park, she, for years she had a home group in her home. So we can all use our resources to advance the kingdom and to build up the church in hospitality. Don't forget Brett's testimony and how important the warmth of hospitality is. So in our busy culture, fight, fight to overcome the challenges of practicing hospitality, overcommitment, intentional me time, isolation, selfishness or pride that, oh, my house is too messy, it's not fancy enough. It's not about the house. It's about the home, hospitality. So following the lead of this first century couple, their actions dis display the grace of Christ, and I encourage you to do the same. The final application went the other direction. We'll, we'll sing after this. The one being taught, Apollos, he was bold, but he was also teachable. This educated, gifted orator listened to tent makers so they could sharpen him. He listened to a female who sharpened him. Humility lends itself to continually learning so that you can be, have greater effectiveness in serving. 
So if you want to have a big impact, more of a speaking ministry, well, be humble and teachable like Apollos. Instead of being quick to speak and slow to listen, be quick to listen and slow in speech so you'll be more effective. Because Apollos is bold, please don't think he was bombastic and quarrelsome. This week I read a Gospel Coalition article about signs of people who are not teachable, but rather just love to quarrel. Does this describe you? Some some of these, does it describe you? You have no unarticulated positions. You have to let everyone know what you think on everything. Some of these hit close to home, by the way. Your only models of faithful ministry, it's the showdown on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal and Jesus cleansing the temple with the whip. Well, sarcasm and whips are not the normal method of personal engagement for the gospel and scripture. They're exceptional. Is your first instinct to correct and then criticize? You see others in need of rebuke, but rarely in need of refreshment and encouragement. Oh, now preacher, you've gone from preaching to meddling. But I'm speaking to myself here as well. Apollos became an influencer because he chose to be influenced and mentored as a humble, teachable man. Let's be that man and woman, and let's be the people who pour into one another in the ministry of the pew. Let's pray as the musicians come up. God, we thank you for this day. Use us, please, Lord. Work by your Spirit, unsheath your sword, and break through our chains by the power of your Word. Revive us, O Lord, we pray, for the glory of our King Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.